Never trust the person that owes you money to determine how much money they owe you. Um, that's in a collision repair. Um, and that's in a total loss claim. You know, insurance companies owe you money and they're going to try and tell you how much money they owe you. Uh, don't do that. Welcome to another episode of the Collision Vision Driven by Auto Body News. As always, I'm your host, Cole Strandberg. As we continue on in our series on insurance, you might get the sense that it can be somewhat of a polarizing topic. So why not bring on a polarizing guest? Just ask him. People either like him, loathe them, or respect him, which he feels any of the above are quite effective in accomplishing the goals he wants. Which one of these do you feel? Billy Wachowiak is the founder and president of Collision Safety Consultants. And today we're going to take a deep dive into topics like how to negotiate, the importance of documentation, and ensuring we do right by the consumer. Enjoy the show. This episode is sponsored by Hunter Engineering. At Hunter Engineering, the theme behind all their products is do it right, do it once. So when you're doing alignments, the time to find hidden damage is before you start, not after. The workflow for Hunter's collision alignment system surfaces the trouble right up front by providing five additional collision-specific measurements, like toe-out on turn, maximum steer, and ride height, to find the problems right away. It's all about efficiency, so find the damage before it finds you. To learn more about Hunter's collision alignment system, visit hunter.com. Enjoy the show. Billy, thank you so much for joining us here on the Collision Vision. I appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to an awesome conversation. I mentioned it to you in our pre-call, but as soon as I heard we were doing a series on insurance, I said, I think I, I think I got our man. So looking forward to talking some insurance with you today. Obviously, a big part of, of your job and, and your company, and we'll get into that a little bit later on, is dealing with challenges as it relates to shops and insurance companies. Let's start kind of broad. What are some of the most common challenges and scenarios you see collision repair shops face in dealing with insurance companies? You know, I never really thought about it, but I would say the, the number one issue is ignorance. Um, ignorance on part of the consumer. Um, ignorance on the part of the adjuster and believe it or not, ignorance on the shop, part of the shop. Um, it, it seems like, um, no one understands exactly what's going on unless they've had some type of class or, um, been educated. In education is obviously a huge topic. It's something that you do a fair bit of on social media, right? Educating. I think your uh, your licensees and your partners across the country do a fantastic job of educating as well. But paint me a picture. When these challenges arise to collision repairers, how does this impact their repair process? How does it impact their overall business operations? And and kind of what's the what's the impact when these challenges occur? Yeah. So, I mean, if you, they don't understand the process, they don't understand um, what they're able to do, um, then they, they can't function properly. Um, I'm amazed at all the times that I've dealt with a shop owner that doesn't know the difference between a first party and a third party claim. Now, a first party claim is when you're dealing with your own insurance company. You're insured with insurance company A, you're in an accident, you turn in that um, a claim to insurance company A, that's your insurance company, um, who has a contractual obligation to work on your behalf. Uh, not only do they have a contractual obligation to work on your behalf, um, they have to be fair and equitable. If they're not, that opens them up to unfair and deceptive trade practices, bad faith claims, et cetera, et cetera. And what surprises me is that shops don't understand what a third party claim is. A third party claim is when Joe hits you and you're going through Joe's insurance company. That's called insurance company B. You have no rights. There aren't, there is no legality for Joe's insurance to do anything for you. Joe pays his insurance company. 
to protect him from you, not to assist you. Um, in fact, it's their job not to pay because if the money they save their customer who hit you is money they save their company. So, in fact, when you try and fight a third-party carrier, you're beating your head against a wall. And all you're going to get is a headache. And it surprises me that uh, these a body shop will say, oh, well, they should have more um, power against someone else because they hurt, hit them. Well, you have none, zero. And I have to explain that to consumers and shops every day, all day long. And it blows my mind that they don't understand the reason you pay insurance is to be protected. You don't pay insurance to pay someone else off. Hmm. The consumer problem seems very challenging. I, I think we can probably agree that educating consumers on all of this is, is probably a lost cause. But from a body shop perspective, other than listening to you and I talk here today and, and your wisdom on the topic, how can body shop owners and leaders really get this process dialed in? Through associations. Um, you know, there's a, there's been a, a huge influx uh, across the nation um, with body shop associations. Um, you know, back in the day, I think they just used to be places for people to sit around and BS. Um, but now they're actually taking up the calls and they're educating shops on contract law. They're edu educating shops on the, the, the Department of Insurance, what they will and what they won't do. Um, and the new associations like North Carolina Body Shop Associations, I think we formed around four or five years ago. Matter of fact, I wrote the very first check to the North Carolina Body Shop Association, became the very first member um, and I'm still a member. But they are um, they're just doing a lot of educational stuff, bringing in people like me, bringing in people like Mike Anderson, bringing, you know, other um, industry people and, and the, and, and the um, associations are paying for them to educate these shops. Uh, BASF has hired me. Um, Micro out of uh, Detroit uh, in Chicago uh, have hired me to, to speak to jobbers, to speak to shops on their behalf. Because if you look at people like BASF and uh, Exalta and some of these companies like this, um, to hire people like me and Mike Anderson and some of these other folks, the more they empower their shops, uh, the more shops will make money and the more money they'll spend. Well said. Now, so much of, of your content that I consume of yours is in the way of stories. And so I, I want to ask for an example here of uh, a situation where somebody would have benefited their, their scenario, their business by understanding exactly what you're talking about here. Where's the value as a body shop owner of, of really understanding this process? So the appraisal clause is, I think, what you're talking about, which is a first party clause. Um, it's kind of forced arbitration in, in the contract, and it allows the consumer to challenge their insurance company on repair cost. Uh, that would be the shop benefit. Um, because let's just say that, you know, Progressive or Farm Bureau or Geico or whomever comes in and, and they write an estimate and it's 10 grand. And the body shop writes a comprehensive estimate of 15 grand. Um, you know, they can very easily go to the consumer and go, you owe me five grand. Or to make a better customer and help that customer, they say, hey, you may have the appraisal clause in your auto policy that will allow you to challenge your insurance company on the repair cost, and you can hire Billable Koviak. Um, you don't have to hire me. There, there's other uh, private or uh, independent appraisers across the country that do what I do. Um, we're probably one of the largest. Collision Safety Consultants is probably one of the largest. Um, but you hire an independent appraiser, and the insurance company must hire an independent appraiser, and the two of them negotiate the claim. We call that leveling the playing field. Man, I'm happy you mentioned collision safety consultants. Uh, I think you're being a little modest in saying probably one of the big organizations of your kind. I think there's likely very few folks in the industry who aren't at least familiar with the name, but I'd like to, to address very directly. Can you explain the role of collision safety consultants in the collision repair industry and how you assist your customers? Sure. So we, we started out, <clears throat> I'll give you a little history. My father-in-law owns a body shop in Belmont, North Carolina, Pat Brothers Collision, and started out um, 
he was one of the first owners of Rec Check, and um, uh, Jim McLinus uh, founded that company. And um, he said, you know, I think you can make a living doing what I do to help people for free. And that's total loss claims, diminished value claims, and post-collision repair inspections. And so I said, okay, um, you know, show me what you got. So I basically shadowed him for about two or three months and uh, said, yeah, I think this is something I can do. Um, and I liked it because I was helping consumers overcome um, uh, the shortfall between them and an insurance company. Um, like So on diminished value claims, it's um, when a car's in an accident, uh, the car loses value based on it having, or ha having a wreck history. So that's what we started out doing was doing the diminished value claims. And um, we started doing the post-collision repair inspections where we were checking other body shops uh, work to make sure that it was done properly and safely and efficiently. So you can imagine by checking other people's shops, um, other uh, shops work, um, I was the bad guy. Um, I don't know if I can cuss on here, but you can imagine what I was known as. Um, and it sure <laughs> wasn't a sweetheart. So shops didn't like me. Um, insurance companies hated me. Um, and consumers, I, I was an angel. Um, I kind of morphed the company into doing more uh, education than standing on body shops necks. Because what I would do is uh, I was very aggressive. I uh, wasn't very nice. And I would point out the shop's um, deficiencies in quite a public forum um, and pretty much embarrass them. Um, and we started doing more education. When we catch a body shop doing it wrong, find out, hey, was there something missing here? Or what, did they cheat somebody? You know, if they cheated somebody or committed fraud, all bets were off. The, we were taking them to the mat. You know, you get no mercy. Um, if it was a tech that took a shortcut, or it was a new manager or someone who didn't know what they were doing. Um, you know, we had a little mercy on them and we actually um, would educate them and, and catching them doing something bad was probably the best thing that ever happened to them. Cause in the meantime, we showed them how they could make more money um, doing it properly. And that's sort of what I think of the organization as I think early on in, in my learning about collision safety consultants, it might've been at the tail end of that, uh, that, that public forum thing, but it, it does seem to have really morphed into an asset for body shops. And my understanding is essentially in, in some cases, you're in many cases, helping the body shops get paid what they're believing a proper estimate looks like. Talk to me about some strategies that that you and your team use to ensure that repairers do get appropriate value for their work from insurers. Um, we we look at the procedures. Um, we look at P pages. We look at uh, OEM repair pr uh, processes. We look to certified shops. Um, we continually get educated um, by you know companies like Raravan. Ryvan, um, we look at Tesla. Um, you know, those are the those are the ones that we have the major challenges with. Uh, Tesla, Jag, Mercedes, any certified shop is where a consumer um, is really going to get beat up because um, the insurance companies are going to try and tell them, you know, we don't owe for that. We we don't. Um, their labor rates too high. They're this. They're too that. And and that will take me back to the relationship between a consumer and a body shop. When Cole takes his car into a body shop, Cole has an agreement with the body shop. The insurance company does not. Well, the insurance company is almost, almost can be considered guilty of torturous interference or violating the contractual obligation between you and the shop. It's because when you take your car into the shop, that contract is between the vehicle owner and the shop. The insurance company doesn't come into play. Now, if the insurance company says they're not going to pay, they're not going to pay the consumer. And so what you and I have been talking about, you say I get shops paid more. Well, I get shops paid more, but what I'm, ultimately what I'm doing is helping the consumer. I'm not actually helping the body shop. Now, it helps the body shop because they get paid and the consumer feels better about the body shop and that they don't have to come out of pocket money. 
Um, but my goal is to make a consumer whole. And in that process, the body shop um, gets made whole without the consumer getting injured. And most importantly, you're, you're working with shops to make sure it's repaired correctly. And that's what we're all in this business to do. It's a, 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 an, a, a real challenge and a very important one to make sure that does happen. When we talk about your role and the collision safety consultants role, the term negotiating comes up, negotiating with insurance companies back and forth. It sort of paints a mental image of, of that attorney, the sparring, all that stuff. Are there any best practices that shops can deploy themselves for going about negotiating with insurers to get fair compensation for repairs? Documentation, 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 documentation. You know, they say real estate is location, 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 <laughs> document, document, document. Um, as I, I refer a lot to my father-in-law, they've been in business 50 years uh, and that's where I get a lot of my information, but I work real closely with Relentless Collision, um, K&M Collision. Um, I, I work with these shops um, that are also in the, in the North Carolina Body Shop Association are getting educated. And one of the things that we teach them and tell them, take a picture of every step of everything you do. So if you're color buffing and sanding, or you're blending an adjacent panel, or you're doing a procedure, take a picture of it. You know, if you're, if you're, um, you want to get paid to uh, clear your welder, take a picture of it. You know, that, that's a procedure. Um, if you're, you know, removing a wheel and you're cutting out the, the, the outer wheelhouse, take a picture. If you refinish the back panel, um, take a picture before you put the outer uh, quarter panel back on. You know, if you're using um, corrosion protection, if you're using um, um, seam sealer, if you're using wax, take a picture. Um, you know, most of the folders um, that Pat Brothers, when they get done with the repair, they're about that thick. Wow. It, it, that's every one. And you're talking 80, 90 pictures. It's a little cost of ink, but there is no question, was it done and back it up? by you know all data um you, you use your all data and says here's what it says you have to do this this and this and this now the insurance companies all day long can say we're not going to pay for that okay because they don't answer to anybody they're demigods sitting up in their little ivory tower trying to tell people what they will and what they won't accept well guess what when it gets to the appraisal clause and it's me against another appraiser and i go well tesla says you have to do this why aren't we doing it you're going to get crickets. You're going to get crickets, and he's going to say, well, that's where it says you have to do it, so you have to do it. And the same thing with they want to challenge labor rates. Now, are you going to tell me that a guy that has no certifications, has no electronic measuring equipment, um, doesn't have a proper welder, you know, maybe has a TIG welder or a MIG welder, but, you know, doesn't have a, a, the, the proper welder, and he's charging $50 an hour, and then you've got Relentless or K&M or one of one of these um, uh, shops that spent, you know, four or five hundred thousand dollars on on lifts and benches and welders and uh, rivet guns. It, you're going to tell me and, and they sent their guys off to training that the labor rate should be the same at a shop that has none of this as it does the other. It doesn't make sense. It makes zero sense. And, and the whole argument that insurance companies have makes zero sense. Because when you ask them to justify, you know, I've had insurance companies tell me they don't believe in diminished value. Are you kidding me? I mean, everybody in America knows if your car's been wrecked, whether it shows up on Carfax or AutoCheck or any of these other things, if you go to a dealer and a dealer says if your car been wrecked, are you going to lie to the dealer? And then if they catch you, now you're in trouble. Matter of fact, it's some type of class H felony uh, in North Carolina under non-disclosure laws. If the vehicle has 25% damage or more and it's five years or newer, you have to disclose that damage. Do you think someone's going to pay the same for a vehicle with a wreck history without? No. But with a straight face, these insurance companies, just like they say, we don't think that the clear needs to go all the way to a breaking point. Okay. Well, let's talk about that um, because who's going to warranty that paintwork? Who's going to warranty that, you know, 
burning in the clear or doing all these stupid things that they say that can get away with. And, and I'll tell you a quick story. I had a Maserati uh, in Florida and the rails on those things, um, frame rail, goes all the way back into the cabin, okay? Comes through the firewall. And the guy uh, was in front of collision and it knocked the condenser off of it. Straight hit, beautiful. Couldn't have timed it any perfect. Well, it ripped the condenser off and the tab off the rail. Simple, right? Just ordered that tab and put it back on it. Cold laser, okay? So if you're going to heat up that rail and it's ultra high strength steel, what are you going to do? You're going to make the rail brittle, right? Okay, so what does is, what is the insurance company say? We'll go back to and cut it off at the uh, firewall. Okay. But you can't do that because the rail goes all the way back. And there's no procedure. So the shop calls Maserati and says, hey, the insurance company wants me to buy the rails, wants me to take the tab off, and wants me to weld it on there. Maserati told him, yeah, you can do that. So now I'm defending this that it can't be done. And I was like, Maserati told you that? And I said, they said, yeah. I said, do you have the guy's name and number? He said, yeah. I said, well, give it to me. And I called the guy and I go, hey, you know, I've got this Maserati down there. The tab's been knocked off, and it, you know, for the condenser. Um, and you told the guy that you can do this. Is there a procedure for that? No. Well, how can you do it? Oh, we're not supposed to do it, but you can do it. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's that simple of someone saying you can do it without asking verification of how to do it. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Well said. Now, for because I'm I'm almost positive there's somebody out here listening to you right now and is saying documentation, documentation, documentation. That's fantastic. I'm going to do that moving forward. However, I have a problem or two right now where I don't have that that inch thick folder of documentation. What are my options? How can I how can I fight to uh, to to come to an agreement here with the insurance company on on value of the repair? I try and live a, a program of honesty, so I'm going to be honest. Let's hear it. Be a superior negotiator like me. <laughs> I mean, it it comes down to that. Yeah. Um, it, it really doesn't come down to the knowledge of the repair. It doesn't come down to the knowledge of any. It, it comes down to, are you a better negotiator? And that's what I am. I'm not an expert on collision repair. I'm not an expert on vehicle values, even though I've been declared as a vehicle valuation expert in court and a diminished value expert. Yes. I am those things, but what I am, I'm a hell of a negotiator and, and either people like me, they loathe me or they respect me. And, and any three of those pretty much gets me what I want <laughs> because if they loathe me, they want to get rid of me. Yeah. You know, um, generally we get paid a whole lot more than the independent appraisers um, that work for insurance companies. Mm. I will bulldog that guy a hundred yards down one way and bulldog him another hundred yards. He wants to give up in 10 yards. Why? He ain't getting paid for it. So, you know, that one way is just perseverance um, and getting up the, the chain of ladder. Insurance company managers hate to get phone calls. Little hint, guys. The reason they're managers is because they got to a point where they don't want to work anymore. And when they start getting complaints, and a lot of people say Department of Insurance complaints don't do anything. They may not get anything done immediately but if you keep reporting the same guy over and over and over again and the manager keeps having to come to, and, and do something that he's normally not doing eventually they're going to give concessions they're going to come around and go man we're just not you know if every consumer filing complaint about jim the adjuster because jim doesn't want to pay for everything then eventually jim's going to get pulled away from that shop hmm well, I don't want to turn this into a masterclass on teaching negotiation. However, since we do have an expert here on that topic, talk to me about, hey, I'm a shop owner. I fix cars. I don't consider myself a negotiator. I didn't go to law school. How can those folks approach these situations and, and learn that art and get better at that 
and and move the needle to where it's a positive for their business and their client? The only way to really do it is to, to get a coach um, or or, start, or have someone else like me or, or one of the other appraisal companies out there uh, do it and teach them. And, and it's really, um, you know, my father-in-law uh, and Pat brothers, we've educated a bunch of shops in North Carolina and we do it just because it's good for the community. Um, you know, it's good for the body shop community in general. And most body shops, if you'll reach out to another body shop that's doing it, um, will help you. Love it. And, and, you know, we're, we're sort of getting into the weeds on negotiating here. And I know the answer is likely it depends, but how do you recommend shops approach insurers when there's a disagreement over the repair process or the cost? There's not really bad blood. We're starting from scratch. Do you just hit them, hit them hard off the bat? Do you play nice? How do we kind of view the cycle of how those conversations evolve? Again, I have changed my, my approach. Um, I used to come in like a bulldog. Um, and you know, sometimes that was good. Sometimes it was bad. Now I'm pretty much nice to everybody. Um, and until someone disrespects me or says something, you know, that I can't live with, I'm still nice. Um, I've got a guy right now that I will not deal with. And my response to him every time is the same. I send him the same response every time. And that's, that is, and, and until we get really from the department of insurance, I will not have any further discussion with you. Um, but when it comes to negotiating, yeah. Um, just be nice, be polite, uh, be respectful, you know, uh, and see what they got, fill everything out. And if the needle doesn't move at all, um, it's not going to move. And I tell people a lot of times, you know, don't waste your time. Um, and if you, if it's someone you've had a problem with, once you get to a personality issue and it's no longer a procedure, procedural issue, um, once it becomes a personality problem, you're not, you're probably not going to come out over, overcome it. Um, and that's what I see in a lot of these shops is an adjuster or an appraiser um, somehow, somewhere will get tweaked with a shop. And now that shop's become their enemy um, for whatever reason. And that's that's never going to get it, probably never going to be overcome. The bad blood piece is, is very, very challenging to overcome once it gets there. So I think that's prudent advice. Try to keep that from happening. Be persistent, but hey, let's start in a polite way. I like that a lot. We've we've really kind of talked about this general topic throughout our conversation here, but I think it's important. So I want to bring this point home from your perspective, from a shop's perspective. Why is it critical for shops to prioritize proper repairs over saying, hey, I'm getting paid this. I'm going to do a repair worth this. What are the real life impacts of that differentiation? Injury, death, and mis dismemberment. Um, liability. So any shop that performs a repair on a vehicle is liable. Doesn't matter what the insurance company wrote. Doesn't matter what the insurance company said. Ultimately, liability falls on the shop owner. So if you're not following your techs and your tech went out there and let's say a, a rear body panel required 80 something rivets and you got tack welded it with four and put the bumper cover over it. And, um, you know, that in some way, shape or form could affect um, airbag deployment. That's on you. That's, you know. So that, that, that's the, the ultimate is um, causing serious harm or death uh, in, 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 the, in the very worst case scenario. Um, do airbags deploy early? Do they deploy late? Um, you know, is the frame rail bent and already been um, um, jeopardized um, for the strength? And the next time it hit, it's gonna collapse. So, you know, any, any part of repair that is not done properly is a liability issue for the shop owner. Striking, right? Scary. Uh, it's 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 extremely important. And to that point, what options do shops have when they're faced with a situation where we've got bad blood with the adjuster? The insurance company will not pay for what I'm trying to do. Where do we go? So you know, your one option is the appraisal clause. 
And the appraisal clause, just because I know a lot of people will want to know, it's not in every policy. It's not in every state. And it doesn't say the same thing everywhere. In North Carolina, it does. We're a uniform policy state. You can challenge repair cost and you can repair, you can challenge um, the value of the vehicle. In some states, you can only challenge the value of the vehicle if it's a total loss. And auto owners um, has become my, th th this is my new um, uh, windmill, um, Don Quixote. Um, auto owners is becoming the very worst company in America based on the appraisal clause policy being removed from their auto policies. It's still in North Carolina because they can't remove it, remove it yet, but almost every other state that I've seen it, what it says is we pay you what we think your car's worth and we'll fix your car the way we think it needs to be repaired. You have no say so in the matter. And if you disagree, pound sand, you can't do anything. So if you have the appraisal clause in your policy and it says if we disagree on the loss or the amount of the loss, then you can challenge repairs. Um, so that that's one thing you can do. Um, the other thing is, you know, you can ask the insurance company management to remove the guy. Um, another is to have a sit down and say, hey, man, what is going on? I actually have one of my appraisers working with an IA that I work with all the time. And he said this appraiser and, and, and he weren't getting along. And I was like, that, that doesn't make any sense. I've been working with this appraiser for 10 years. And we, we're, you know, we're on, we're simpatico, things go like this. So I called the other appraiser and I said, hey, my guy says y'all aren't getting along. And the other appraiser said, you know, well, I, something was weird and this and that. And, and so then I talked to both of them. And here I am mediating for my own appraiser against a competitor. Um, you know, who represents an insurance company. And I was like, you know, y'all just need to get along. And if you can't, I'll, I'll step in and do it. Well, that's not necessary. Okay. And so now they're getting along. Um, so, you know, the, you, you got the appraisal clause, you got the ability for a manager. If he's, if he's, if he's truly, if a manager is truly in, interested in helping their customers and their consumers, and there is bad blood, they'll remove that adjuster, that appraiser and put somebody else in there. Options exist. Some real challenges, some real uh, kind of charged scenarios here and potentially emotional. So uh, good to know kind of what options there are, the lay of the land. We mentioned too early on in our conversation today about the consumer education and the challenge that comes with that. How can shops educate their customers about the importance of what's going on, quality repairs, potential safety risks of inadequate repairs and challenges that that shop might be facing with their insurer. It, it is a little time consuming, but every single, every single customer that comes through that front door, you need to prepare them for the phone call that they're going to get from the insurance company. That's going to tell them that your shop charges stuff that no other shop charges. And then you're going to inform them to ask them, well, what, what other shops? Oh, well, are they DRP shops? Oh, well, are those shops that you give concessions to for them to send you business? Oh, so a shop that is given concessions um, to send you business doesn't charge the same as a shop that's on its own working solely for the consumer. So um, I've seen it in, in multiple shops that are doing it this way. And, and they set that customer up and prepare them. And then they'll go, man, that adjuster said exactly what you told me they were going to say before they said it. And, and that, that stops that the insurance companies telling the consumer that the shop is overcharging for stuff when the consumer knows ahead of time, that's going to be the defense that the insurance company is going to use every time. Repetition helps, right? Knowledge in the space. The more reps you take, the better you get at it and then and, and get to address kind of what we're discussing here today. Billy, you've been very generous with your time, man. Happy we could connect here. It's uh, it's long overdue. As you know, we like to wrap up each episode of the Collision Vision with three key takeaways. If our listeners take away three things from our conversation today, what should those be? Well, the first is my tagline. Um, never trust the person that owes you money to determine how much money they owe you. Um, that's in a collision repair. Um, that's in a total loss claim. You know, insurance companies owe you money. 
and they're going to try and tell you how much money they owe you. Uh, don't do that. Um, the second thing is um, do your homework. Um, document every procedure. Um, you've got, um, you know, I, and I'm going to say this, I'm not a huge fan of ICAR, um, but you've got all data. You've got um, OEM one stop. Um, go to the shop um, OEM procedures and get those documented in your repair process. Um, so there's less of a pushback when you send in that estimate. Um, and the third thing is um, protect the consumer. Um, if you protect the consumer and you, can, you, you educate the consumer, that consumer is going to tell other consumers it's going to build your business. You're going to do a better, safer, complete repair without your consumer or customer being out of pocket money. Good stuff there, Billy. And, and you sort of you sort of said it a little early on. People are going to love you. They're going to loathe you or they're going to respect you no matter how they feel about that. Number three is one that rings true for, for everybody listening. We're protecting the consumer. That's what we're doing in this business. And it is it's very, very important. Where can people follow along with you and learn more about Collision Safety Consultants? So um, if you want to find a location closest to you, it's collisionsafetyconsultants.us. Um, that's my United States uh, locations as well as I've got one in Australia and one in Canada. Um, LinkedIn is Bill Wachowiak. Um, Facebook is uh, Collision Safety Consultants and Bill Wachowiak. And um, on um, Instagram, it's at Billy Safety, which also goes, uh, shares the same as uh, my Collision Safety Consultants. But you know what you're talking about, I, I tell stories and it really ticks people off sometimes and I get a kick out of it. Um, Mary Layton was my, um, and I'm going to give a shout out to Mary Layton. She was my, uh, her and Judy Planer were my English teachers at Gaston Day in Ashbrook. And I took creative writing and I have dyslexia. So I'm, I'm terrible at reading, um, but I loved creative writing. And I'll sit down 15, 20, 30 minutes at night and write one of these stupid, sappy, rhymy things. And, um, you know, people get a kick out of it. It, it educates some. And then I'll get tired for a while and I'll just go back and just give them the facts. But, um, you know, might as well be fun. Hey, absolutely. Never a boring conversation with you, I would imagine, one way or another. But appreciate you sharing your insights here today. I'll be sure to include those links in the show notes. Billy Wachowiak, thank you so much for joining us on The Collision Vision. Cole, thanks for having me, buddy. Thank you again to Billy Wachowiak for joining us on today's show. The man can certainly be polarizing, but the end goal of protecting the consumer is one that we can all agree on. And I hope you found some actionable insights from our conversation today. I know I certainly did myself. So much of this conversation focused on the importance of being educated, being educated on proper repairs and pro proper processes, being educated on how to document appropriately, on how to negotiate, and being educated on how to educate your customers. That's all for today's episode of The Collision Vision. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcasts and on YouTube, where The Collision Vision lives in video form. As always, on behalf of the Autobody News team and myself, thank you for coming along for the ride. Mm -hmm.